This evening, I thought we'd take a look at Psalm 11, and part 11 of the 150-part series that we're never going to finish, uh, which basically isn't that regularly or reoccurring. But we'll look at Psalm 11, and I've titled this lesson, Flee as a Bird, because that expression just happens to occur in this psalm. And, uh, you know, I toyed with the idea of requesting... There's a song in our songbook called Flee as a Bird. It's actually number 380. And, you know, the more I read this psalm, the more I think that it doesn't have anything to do with this psalm at all other than that particular shared line, which is why I resisted the idea of requesting it this evening. And in fact, uh, might even say a little bit of the opposite of the point of the psalm, but not really, but we're, we're going we're gonna to see what I'm talking about as we get into it. I actually think that the song in the songbook is a very good song. It's just not what Psalm 11 is saying. So... Uh, we'll, we'll get into this, and really what we need to do is read the psalm for what it says, and then talk about it. Beginning verse 1, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Now this psalm is what we might call a psalm of trust, which I realize that's probably not the most helpful classification in the world because you know, almost all of the psalms express trust in God. Uh, but, you know, this psalms of trust, I guess, pay more attention to that particular theme, and uh, we had to invent a category for things we couldn't classify, so that's what we're calling it, more or less. But it really wrestles with the central question, why should I trust in God? Why can't I just rely on myself? Why can't I just rely on human solutions to problems? That's what we're getting at here. Let's talk about some of the features of this psalm. I'm all, if you know me and you've had any conversation with me about the psalms for any length of time, you'll know that I really like finding connections with the first two psalms in the book. Because I think that the first two psalms in the book are kind of set the stage for the rest of the book. And so, for instance, you can find several connections. For instance, uh, Psalm 11 verse 1 says, In the Lord I take refuge. The same expression is used in Psalm 2 in verse 12. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. It's the exact same verb in Hebrew. Um, Psalm 11 talks about this conspiracy of the wicked. The wicked bending the bow. They want to kind of catch the, uh, the righteous man and destroy him. Very similar to what you see at the beginning of Psalm 2, when the nations conspire together to overthrow the Lord's anointed, His chosen one. Um, of course, this psalm also talks about the destruction of the wicked. He will rain snares on the wicked. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup in 11 verse 6. And compare that to the uh, Psalm 1, the end of Psalm 1, that the wicked are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And of course, in contrast with that, Psalm 1 also talks about the salvation of the righteous. The righteous man is going to be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of waters, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Psalm 1, verse 3. And in verse 6, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, again, you get the same thing in Psalm 11. The last line of the psalm, the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, the upright will behold his face. So that kind of language is all over the place, and you can do this with almost any psalm, but you can do it here in Psalm 11 as well. And really what we have here is the same dilemma that is going on throughout this book, and really, I would argue, throughout the whole Bible. Which is that we have a picture before us of an ideal world, and that ideal world doesn't actually exist right now. Psalms 1 and 2 talk about a world where the righteous 
uh, get their reward and the wicked get their just desserts and everybody gets what they deserve and there's punishment given for the wicked and there's salvation given for the righteous and everything goes well. But in that ideal world, well, we look around us and we see well, not everything is always so ideal, is it? That's why you have the Psalms of Trust in the Bible. The Psalms of Trust carry this idea that even though the world doesn't look ideal right now, we ought to trust God to take care of us. We ought to trust God to make it right, the things that have gone wrong. That's the idea behind Psalm 11. Now, I want to look at this other, another feature that's really prominent in Psalm 11 is this focus on righteousness or uprightness, the idea of being right before God. Uh, and just to kind of highlight, you know, this short little psalm makes references to things like this. In 11 verse 2, the wicked man is uh, conspiring to shoot the upright with arrows. In 11 verse 3, they ask the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? In verse 5, it says that God tests the righteous and the wicked. In verse 7, it says that God is righteous. It also says that God loves righteousness. And it says, as a result, the upright will see God's face. So there's this constant theme of righteousness and uprightness that is uh, all over Psalm 11. And that is, is important to realize as we're, we're coming into this text and we're trying to understand it a little bit. Okay, and I see already, and before we even get to the next slide, that there's another embarrassing mistake that I've made. And it says that this is the outline of Psalm 10. That is not correct. We are not in Psalm 10 this evening. We are in Psalm 11. But somebody goofed up. Uh, I have to have a talk with the person who makes my PowerPoints Why are you giving me a funny look, Jen? You don't make the PowerPoints. <laughs> like, anyhow, if she made the PowerPoints, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> she would have caught the mistake. Uh, Psalm 11, the opening line of verse 1, makes this opening claim. Uh, in the Lord I take refuge. In Yahweh I take refuge. That's really the theme of the psalm. And when you think about it, that's really the theme, arguably, of the whole book. That those who take refuge in God are blessed. Those who put their trust in Him are blessed. Mm. But why would we take refuge in God? This psalm makes the point and drives the point home that there is no viable alternative. Not really. If we don't take refuge in Him, what's going to happen to us? We're not going to have safety. We're not going to have hope. We're not going to have a solution to our problems. It's an expansion of this idea. Those who take refuge in Him are blessed, and everyone who doesn't take refuge in Him is not blessed. It's so important to see God as our source of refuge. And if you're not convinced, He's got reasons. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? He says at the beginning, at the end of verse 1. Flee to your mountain like a bird. Uh, and, you know, there, that line, it's... It's like the psalmist is surrounded by bad advisors who are basically just saying, head for the hills. Give it up. Quit. Run for it. Flee. Flee like a bird to your mountain. You know. Now the image of a bird in flight is used elsewhere in the Psalms. Uh, for instance, in Psalm 55 in verse 6, uh, it's used to talk about escape from the enemies. Psalm 55 and verse 6, David writes, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hasten to my place of refuge from the stormy wind and tempest. And there David is saying, you know, that's how I would get away from the enemies. That's how I would escape my place of refuge is by flying away. Or we might look at the 124th Psalm, Psalm 124, in verse 7. 
It said, well, I'll start in verse 6. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So there again, that image of a bird fleeing is kind of connected with trust in God. But in Psalm 11, it's not really being used that way. Which is, again, why I say that, you know, this song in our songbook, Flee as a bird to your mountain. Uh, you know, the song in the book portrays it as like you're fleeing to get away from sin and get towards God. Which is the way it's used in other psalms, but not in Psalm 11. So, um... It's just kind of interesting to note that. I mean, David himself describes himself this way too. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 26, for instance, whenever David is fleeing for his life and trying to escape from Saul, one of the ways he describes himself, uh, whenever he finally confronts Saul in the wilderness, he says in verse 20, Do not let my blood fall to the ground, away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, just as one heart hunts a partridge in the mountains. Saul's wasting his time hunting for David. David's like this lonely bird that's fled to the mountains, and Saul's out there trying to hunt for him, and he's wasting all these national resources when he should be fighting the Philistines, by the way. You know, and David didn't even do anything wrong to deserve that. The wicked... Uh, I mean, you know, it's the similar things going on in Psalm 11. And some people think Psalm 11 was written while David was hiding from Saul in the wilderness. We can't know that because we actually don't know when most of the Psalms were written. But that idea is out there. Um, what, but what we have here is this idea of the wicked hunting for the righteous man. Trying to destroy him. Verse 2 gives this image of the wicked bending back the bow. Taking aim. Shooting him through the heart in the darkness. The wicked can't stand the righteous man. He's got to do anything he can to get him out of the way. In verse 3, it says that if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, we talk about foundations. We talk about things like the order of society, uh, the things that, you know, make sense of the world around us. Ultimately, though, I mean... What can the righteous do if the thing he has built his trust on and his hope on is taken away from him? Well, nothing. He can't be saved by that. The righteous are ultimately incapable of saving themselves. They need God to be their foundation. They need God to be their refuge. This is the sole thing that separates the righteous from the wicked, really, if you think about it. What's your foundation? What's your refuge? You know... What separates the righteous from a wicked person isn't, you know, well, I've got more good deeds on my rap sheet than you've got good deeds on your sheet, and I've got less bad deeds on my rap sheet than you've got on yours, so that makes me more righteous. No! That's not what, the way it works. The way it works is that, you know, whether or not someone has actually placed their trust in God, whether or not someone has genuinely made God their refuge and their foundation, that's what gives the righteous hope. If the wicked are going to be so intent on tearing down order and reason, leaving everything in vain, uh, leaving everything in chaos, what options do you have left? Well, none. Run for the hills. Flee like a bird. Give up. Is that what you should do? Is there any other choice? Well, yeah, we do have another option. Verse 4. Yahweh is in His temple. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. You know, repeating an admonition that you see elsewhere in the scriptures. When Habakkuk was so puzzled at how the Lord could inflict suffering on the people through an enemy that was more wicked than they were. Look, it says that the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Habakkuk 2.20 Isaiah also wrote similarly in Isaiah 66, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. God's on the throne. He sees what's going on. It doesn't escape his notice. There's another connection with Psalm 2, by the way, that he who sits in the heavens laughs at the idea 
of the wicked thinking that could win some kind of conspiracy against him. He's in his temple. His throne is in heaven. In Psalm 5, in Psalm 5, the psalmist is describing the, the horrible situation uh, that he is in, and he starts talking about, he starts appealing to God to act, to fix the scenario, and he says in Psalm 5 and verses 4 through 7, that you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, no evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence for you. God's presence in His holy temple is where we can look to for hope. Even when the rest of the world doesn't make sense. Even when the walls seem to be closing in. Even when the foundations beneath us seem to be crumbling. Look to the temple of the Lord. Look to the presence of God for hope. And the result of God being in His temple is that there will be judgment. Judgment on the wicked. Refuge for the righteous. This is really... The whole point we've been getting out all along. Uh, verse 4 says that God is testing all mankind. His eyes test the righteous. Uh, well, no, his eyes behold, his eyelids test. Um, you know, the exact meaning of that is the idea, you know, he's looking at you, he's examining you, he's trying to see what you're made of. You know, and trying to see if there is anything, if, if in fact, you are going to endure these things. He tests the righteous and the wicked in verse 5. And when God tests the righteous and the wicked, He finds out what they are. He sees their hearts. He can examine them and decide what their motives really are. Because people will sometimes say, oh, God knows my heart. He does know your heart, actually. Probably better than you represent it. Well, the result of this, of course, is He hates those who love violence. And he saves those who are righteous. You know, this raises all kinds of interesting questions. When it says that the Lord, uh, the one who loves violence, his soul hates. And of course a lot of people ask, well wait a second, I thought God loved the, sin the sinner but just hated the sin. And, but, the strictest, but strictly speaking, the scripture sometimes affirms that God does hate the sinner. I mean, we just read a passage in Psalm 5 about how the Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit, how he hates those who do iniquity, how he destroys those who speak falsehood. It's the same idea in Psalm 11. You know, the, God, the Bible never actually says that God only hates the sin and not the sinner. Now there's a sense, of course, in which God really did love the whole world so that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. John 3, verse 16. And, you know, we're talking about the world. When Jesus, when Jesus says that, he's not talking about planet Earth that God loves. He's talking about the realm of evil. He's talking about the people, the sinful people. I mean, Romans 5 also gets into this point, too, that nobody in their right mind dies for somebody that's ungodly, except that that's exactly what God did. He died for people who were sinful and who were enemies of his, people who were hated ones by him. But even though God loved the world enough to make that sacrifice, there is a sense in which the judgment of God really is an expression of both the, the sin, of hatred, of both the sin and the person that commits it. The person that willfully chooses to remain in sin, refuses to repent. When the Lord sees them on the, on the great day of judgment and says, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Another quote from the Psalms, by the way. That's an expression of hatred. That's a rejection, a repudiation of whom they are because they have chosen to be something that God is not. And that God does not like. Mm. There's one reason why John 3.16 even implicitly warns against the wrath of God. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Which implies there really is a danger of perishing. He shall not perish, but have eternal life. The fact is that those who trust him are not going to perish implies that they're, well, those who do, do not trust him will. And Romans 5 talks about how Jesus' death really is a means of saving us from the wrath of God. But we can still endure that. We're not careful. 
So when the scripture says the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates, I tell you something. You can love the Lord and the Lord will love you back, or you can choose to love violence. You can choose to love sin. You can choose to love iniquity. But the Lord doesn't share your interests there. He doesn't share your love. If you don't share the love of the Lord, there's nothing left but the hatred of the Lord. And verse 6 talks about fire and brimstone. Mm. Fire and brimstone. Um, one of the few places the Bible mentions fire and brimstone. Uh, the first place it's mentioned is in Genesis 19 when the Lord rains fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it's also mentioned a few other times in the Old Testament, including here. And it is the model for the New Testament lake of fire. Revelation 19, verse 20, 20, verse 10, 21, verse 8. The people who are wicked, Satan, everyone who loves Satan and follows Satan, all of them will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's similar to the imprecation we saw in Psalm 10, the curse that was placed. In Psalm 10, 15, the psalmist wrote, Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. You know, can we pray things like that? You know, there's, some, there's some people out there that don't, don't think we, you know, we can't pray that today. You know, it's inspired. It's in the Bible. But, you know, we get very squeamish about imprecation. And the truth is, I think that there's a sense in which we really do need to reclaim that dichotomy between good and evil in our minds. That we can't pray for the salvation of the righteous unless we also pray for the destruction of their wicked oppressors. It cannot be done. Implicitly, explicitly, however you want to do it. It's, you, know, you can't separate those two events. They go hand in hand with each other. And you look at this... By contrast, no, the wicked get fire and brimstone, the righteous get to see God's face. If there's ever a text that, you know, it succinctly explains the difference between heaven and hell, that's it right there. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup, the wicked. The upright will behold his face. That's, no, that's the contrast right there. The righteous get to see God's face. The God who sees all. Verse 4 is the God who we get to see. Verse 7. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. And they saw God face to face. And they had a relationship there that was good. And when then they were expelled from the garden, nobody could see God's face. God told Moses in the wilderness that no one can see my face and live. And even though the Bible sometimes says that Moses saw God face to face and talked with him as a man talks with his friend... It seems that there was still something lacking, something inadequate there. And John, in John 1 and verse 18, says that no one has seen God at any time. And yet God's presence is manifested among His people through Jesus. We're hoping for something more. We're hoping to someday see the face of God. That's the reward for taking refuge in Him. Why else does the 24th Psalm say, Psalm 24, ask the question. In verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. That's the goal. Getting into his holy place. Seeing his face. And what a glorious goal that is when you really think about it. Let's talk about some of the applications of this psalm. First, I want to ask, how does Jesus fulfill this psalm? Now, any list of Old Testament passages about Jesus is too short. It does not include the entire Old Testament. And this psalm is no exception. So let's ask ourselves something. When Jesus was in the situation of the psalmist, and he was surrounded by the enemies of these around him, what did he do? Did he flee? He could, could he have fled? Well, yeah, he could have done that. But he trusts God instead of fleeing. When he was arrested in the garden and surrounded by people who wanted to take him to his death, he could have fled like a bird. He'd previously escaped situations where people were trying to kill him. He could have passed through the crowd. 
He could have just prevented them from laying hands on him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he demonstrates in John chapter 18, he is fully capable of overpowering this mob. In John chapter 18 and verse 3, and Judas, having received from the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And you know, just for reference's sake, a Roman cohort is around 600 guys. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. And when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he asked again, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way. Now, would you be scared to arrest that guy? <laughs> he just knocked everybody over. You know, it's not like they all tripped. Well, they did. My wife pointed out that they did trip over the rock that is Jesus. But, uh, but I mean, there's some, I guess, some validity to that. But, but what's really going on here? He could get out of the situation. He really, I mean, for if anybody had the option of literally fleeing like a bird out of that situation, it was Jesus. And what happened instead? He intentionally walks into the snare laid for him by his enemies, knowing full well what it is. Knowing full well what it leads to. When Jesus hung on the cross, what did he do? What could he have done? The enemies were mocking him. They were saying, Oh, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe. He could have gotten down from the cross all right. Once again, he could have fled like a bird. He tells Peter in Matthew 26 and verse 53 that he could have summoned 12 legions of angels to get him out of that situation. But he doesn't do that either. Jesus wasn't crucified because he was a weakling. He wasn't crucified because he was incapable of escaping. There was a way of escape, and he chose not to take it. Instead, what happens? He lets the wicked set their proverbial arrows against them and destroy him who was most upright in heart. When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And when the one who laid the foundations of the world is destroyed, what can anyone do? But what did Jesus do? He trusted God. And because he trusted God, because he committed himself to God who judges righteously, because he took refuge in God, per what it says here in this psalm, he was vindicated as righteous. He became not only the living embodiment of someone who doesn't give up his trust in God, he became the living embodiment of the statement that the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And in verse 7, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. That's resurrection right there. Jesus vindicate, is vindicated by God. He trusted in the Psalms' promise that God really did love righteousness. And if God, I mean, because if God loves righteousness so much, he must have a plan to vindicate Jesus, right? He did. It was called the resurrection. Jesus was the most upright man of all, and he rose from the dead never to die again. He ascended to heaven where he saw the face of his Father. He ascended into the heavenly temple where he sat down on that great throne. Jesus is living proof of this psalm. It pays to trust God. <coughs> what about us? What can we learn? First of all, trusting God means that we reject human solutions. And the human solution given here is flee like a bird to the mountain. <laughs> the mountains are not our place of refuge, but God is. If we trust in his power, we'll stop thinking, hey, maybe man has the answers to this. You know, Satan tries to trick us into thinking that we can solve our problems in human ways. We just need to throw more money at the problem. We just need to elect the right guy. We just need to marry the right person. We just need to do this or that. But if our trust is not in God, it's all for naught. Hope is only found taking refuge through Yahweh. Without that, 
No amount of flight, no amount of contingency plans, no amount of strategic thinking on our part is going to fix anything. Second, there will be a judgment. It's coming. And that judgment's going to destroy the wicked. Now, implicitly, of course, that means you probably shouldn't be wicked. That's a bad idea. Uh, you shouldn't be allying ourselves with the enemies of God. We shouldn't be making ourselves more like the enemies of God. And the truth is, you know, this psalm is a reminder. Hell is hot, and eternity is a really long time. You know, I mean, you think about it, you know, and I know I'm... I'm, I'm probably I'm not I don't fit into the stereotype I guess of the fire and the brimstone preacher. Uh, my wife asked me to do a scary sermon on hell once, and I did, and she said it wasn't scary afterwards. So um, I don't know. I mean, I think just reading about it, and learning information about it, is scary enough. Because what is it ultimately? The real fate of the wicked and what they get is right here in verse six. The fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. It's not just, you know, that they're going to get burnt a little bit. It's that that's going to be their portion. That's all they get. That's scary. And because of that judgment that's coming, we really, really, really should not want to be part of that group. I don't want to go to the lake of fire. I want to see the face of God. Because that's the greatest blessing. The greatest blessing is still seeing God. If we trust in Him, we will be with Him forever. If we take Him at His word, we will do what He says. If we choose His presence, take joy in Him. Which, in light of all of this, brings my attention to the hymn number 380 in our book again, Flee as a Bird. Because, and here's the, the funny thing, it's like it makes the same point that the psalm makes, but not worded the same way. Flee as a bird to your mountain. Only in this case, your mountain is not these human solutions, like the psalmist portrays it, but rather God, again, as your real mountain, your real source of refuge. Flee as a bird to your mountain, thou who art weary of sin. Go to the clear flowing fountain, where you may wash and be clean. Fly, for the avenger is near thee. Call, and the Savior will hear thee. He on his bosom will bear thee, O thou who art weary of sin. You know, in other words, God is really the only place where you can find refuge. If you're weary of your sins, that's the place to go. He will protect thee forever, wipe every falling tear. He will forsake thee, O never, sheltered so tenderly there. Haste, then the hours are flying. Spend not the moments in sighing. Cease from your sorrow and crying. The Savior will wipe every tear. Don't flee to the mountain like a bird. Flee to God as your refuge. The one source of eternal life that you have. Abandon your sin. Forsake yourself and follow the Lord instead as your true safety. If you are here tonight and your relationship with the Lord is not what it needs to be, and you need to make your life right with the Lord, well, now is an appropriate time to let it be known and to come to Him. While together we stand and we sing the song that was selected.